How many of you have uh, contributed a, a patch to some sort of uh, Mesos framework before? Show of hands. All right. Got a lot of newbies in here. Uh, who's tried to build their own custom framework before? Anybody? Oh, all right. Who's actually gotten a proof of concept to work? Good. Some, that's a good success rate. Anybody gone beyond a proof of concept to something that's more production ready? All right. All right, we're doing good. We're doing good. Uh, so as you know, we're passing around the USB keys. They've got vagrant images. Um, yeah. And so for those of you that just got a proof of concept and want to know what's next, you know, it's pretty easy to, within an hour or so, get an up, a framework up and running that accepts offers and launches tasks. But you know, what else is there to learn? Quite a lot. You know, there's uh, roles and reservations and these new persistence primitives. There's scheduler HA, task reconciliation, state abstractions, status updates, framework messages, framework authentication, ACLs and security. Uh, there's newer maintenance primitives, revocable offers, and a little hard to read, but uh, you know, Mesosphere has a product called DCOS, and so there's some additional uh, points that you have to do to integrate with DCOS and the upcoming 1.0 HTTP API. We'll talk about a lot of this, and you know, we'll be available for questions afterwards. And yes, if you are done with your key or you need a key, please raise a hand and, and let us know. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, gonna, I'm going to start with some framework patterns, uh, common patterns that uh, you know, can be useful for different types of Mesos frameworks and distributed systems. We'll dive into uh, an overview of the API and touch on resource allocation, failure handling, security, et cetera. And then what you all are here for real is writing some code, making your, product, your frameworks more production ready. And we're, we're going to be using Rindler, which uh, is an example framework we've used plenty of times before. Uh, it's in many different languages, so you can pick your favorite and dive in, add, add one of these more production ready features to it, and learn a lot about building Mesos frameworks. So the core dynamic uh, that some of you are already familiar with is Mesos will make resource offers to your framework scheduler uh, saying, you know, there's an agent here that has this set of resources available. Would you like to do something with them? And then it's up to your scheduler to make decisions to launch tasks on those resources or decline the offer so that those resources can be offered to another framework. It's very important that you decline and don't hoard offers unless you know what you're doing. Uh, in dot 23, we've added some of these persistence primitives, which are other operations you can do on uh, resource offers, and we'll touch on that in a bit. So you receive resource offers, you launch some tasks, and once those tasks are running, you get status updates. Uh, and with those status updates, it's your scheduler's responsibility to update your local view of the global state of all your tasks, what's running where, what's completed, what's failing. And then, again, with that status, uh, you make decisions on future resource offers about, oh, this failed. I got more resources. Let me launch it somewhere else. Uh, so you've got a lot of tools at your disposal. Mesos provides a state abstraction so that you can uh, store your, uh, your state, your framework ID, and uh, task statuses in somewhere off the node so it persists even if your scheduler fails over. We provide status updates uh, you know, from an executor to the framework to provide information about you know, whether your task is running, failed, et cetera. Uh, we provide tools for building custom executors if you have behavior, uh, specialized behavior that you want on the agent to manage you know, one or more tasks running on that machine. And then framework messages so your schedulers and your executors can communicate back and forth with each other. So let's talk about a few common patterns. Resource math. So Mesos may offer you 10 gigs of RAM, but you want to launch a task that only uses two. So it's up to you to take the resource offer and then know how much resources you want for your task and 
offer that uh, and launch the task only with the subset of that offer. If you claim the entire offer, then nobody else can use those resources, and that's not friendly. Uh, so when you get an offer, you decide, does this offer satisfy a task that I want to run? Maybe it doesn't offer you enough resources, or there are attributes and constraints that don't match what you want. So you can examine all the information in the offer and make your decision intelligently there, and then figure out what's left of this offer after I launch the task. So you can actually get an offer and launch multiple tasks on the same offer on the same node if they all fit. Another common pattern is tracking task metadata. So the scheduler state is usually associated with these task IDs. So you'll create a unique task ID, usually, per task that you're launching. And you can keep track of, I launched this, it's running, it's completed, it's failed. But you want to be able to, uh, so you, you'll update state when you get these status updates telling you the, the latest status of, the, of your task. And you can persist this data uh, in the Meso state abstraction, which is backed by the replicated log or Zookeeper, or there's an in-memory version that's really just useful for testing, because you actually want to persist this in case your scheduler fails over. Uh, another common pattern is dealing with intermediate results. And this is best accomplished with a cu custom executor. So maybe you want to be able to tell your scheduler, oh, I have, uh, I'm 10% done, 50% done, and you can send this through uh, other custom status updates from your custom executor, or you can use framework messages. Maybe you want to trigger like, oh, we've reached a new stage of our, uh, of our state machine. I'm ready to like, initialize and, and get things up and running. So we provide a lot of primitives that allow you to work, work with this. Gang scheduling is another interesting pattern. Um, maybe you have some sort of application where if you need to run 10 instances of something, and if you only have enough to run nine, there's no reason to even try to launch any of them until you have enough to run all 10, because they're just going to be sitting there eating idle resources. So a common approach there is offer hoarding. So when offers are made to you, rather than immediately responding and launching a task that'll sit there doing nothing, you can hold on to that offer and wait until you have just enough to launch all of them all at once. And you want to bound this to some extent uh, because you, know, you don't want to hold on to your offers forever. That's not nice to other frameworks. And maybe you will never get enough resources to launch your 10,000 task job. So you have to be careful about that. Uh, Mesos even provides, a, Mesos may even revoke some of the, or rescind some of these offers uh, if, that it's previously made to you if the t this uh, agent disappears or if you've been holding on to it for too long. So you have to be aware of that. And a uh, final pattern that I'm going to mention is a fleet of services. Uh, one example of this is the HDFS framework, where there are different types of tasks that you're launching. First, you'll launch a few journal nodes, wait for them to become healthy, then launch name nodes, perhaps even co-located with the journal nodes, wait for them to become healthy, and then spin up all your data nodes. And the, the best way to deal with all of this is with a state machine. You, know, you have these different states of what stage of the uh, initialization process you're in. And then if things start to die, you know, if your name nodes or journal nodes die, you need to go back to a previous state so that you can relaunch uh, those and reinitialize them. So there may be like a bootstrap phase and a running phase, and you need to uh, monitor the status of the di different types of tasks and maybe use framework messages to trigger the changes in that state. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it on to Elizabeth to cover uh, more of the API overview. Great. Thanks, Adam. So the overall uh, framework architecture of Mesos, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Many of you are still learning um, about Mesos itself, is we have the Mesos master and we have the Mesos agents. And the Mesos agents have available resources, you know, CPU, disk, memory. Then they offer these resources. It goes through the Mesos master. And your distributed application or your framework then can use these resources. So these resources are sent to the scheduler. And then your framework scheduler can launch tasks on different executors on the agent nodes. 
and it can accept either full or partial amount of the offer. If it accepts a partial amount of the offer, the remaining offer will then get re-offered, say, to another distributed framework or back to the same framework in the future. So just delving into those pieces, the scheduler and the executors, we have the framework info. Um, as a developer of distributed applications or frameworks, this is something you want to pay attention to. You have your, your username, your name, your ID. Um, an important piece is the failover timeout and the framework ID. The framework ID is typically persisted within Zookeeper. So that way, if you have a failover timeout greater than zero, if your scheduler basically dies and you want to relaunch it, or you even want to relaunch a new scheduler running this distributed application, then you can go ahead and retrieve the same framework ID from Zookeeper. And as long as your failover timeout has not elapsed, then you can re-register. And this is, again, really helpful because you cannot control your scheduler process at all times. The machine may die. Anything may happen in distributed systems. Also, something useful is the role. So you may want to reserve particular resources. And you want to do that based on your role. This could be statically or dynamically with the new dynamic reservations. We also have um, another important feature, which is principle. So if you want to do framework authentication, if you want to enable the security feature, then your Mesos master um, will require you to register with your principal and pass this along to show that you're authorized um, to actually run on Mesos and communicate with the master. If you set this, you probably also want to set the role, because on your Mesos master, you may have security settings saying, I only want frameworks with the role HDFS or Kafka for instance, to be able to register, assuming they have the principle in secret. So for scheduler calls, um, there are a lot of important calls for the scheduler. There's a life cycle management. As Adam mentioned, we want to manage the full life cycle of the distributed application. Important there is task management. When we get task status requests, a very common pattern is to use a state machine. Um, as he mentioned, you may want to go from the journal node initialization state to launching the name nodes and so on. Also, resource allocation. So when you're creating your executors um, and your tasks, you want to make sure you allocate the appropriate resources, and that would be done through the scheduler. There's also the communication with the executors and the tasks, um, the ability to register, re-register, unregister, and to decline or request or revive offers. And similarly here, the scheduler events. It receives task status. It can receive a framework message, registered, re-registered. And it's important to note that framework messages um, may or may not go through, whereas task status messages are guaranteed. So just keep that in mind in your development of frameworks. For executor events, we have, again, similar registered, re-registered, disconnected, shutdowns, um, the ability to launch and kill tasks, uh, task management, lifecycle management of the executor as well, and communication to your distributed application scheduler. And this can be done uh, via test status or also via framework message, which is not guaranteed. So again, here the executor calls, send status update related to a task, send framework message, uh, task management, and communication. Now for resource offers, as a framework developer, this is something that you'll see pretty often. You'll be receiving offers, and these offers will contain resources. And they will contain memory, CPU, disk, and ports. Certain things can be ranges. For instance, you might receive a range of ports in your offer and you would want to accept the ports that you need to use. Um, you also may get a certain amount of memory. You probably don't want to use it all. Um, you could, though, depending on your application and its needs, your task and its needs, and um, CPU as well. And there's also a role. So if you have a received resource or a reserved resource and it's reserved for a particular role, then what will happen is when you get the offer, it will have that role, and that way you'll be able to accept it only if you have it reserved. 
So offers are consumed by launching, declining, um, or accepting them. So um, there are actually two steps when you're accepting and launching a t accepting an offer and launching a ta uh, task. And the reason why is we want to make sure that we put that in two steps because you may want to accept multiple offers. Um, you may want to launch a series of tasks with those offers. So that's why it was thought to break it into two steps, accept offer and then launch task. We, you also have the option of declining the offers. You can also filter the ones you accept. Um, so you can put a filter on and that way you'll only receive specific offers. If you decide you want to get rid of the filter, you can go ahead and call revive offers, and then you'll get sent all your offers, not just the filtered ones. Um, the, these two pieces of code I've noticed are pretty confusing for framework developers. Um, we're trying to make it simpler and easier to understand. So basically, in Mesos, there are two types of ex executors as of now. There's a default command executor, and what that does is that just simply launches a task that runs on the command line and executes a command. And that is built into Mesos. There's also a custom executor. This is something you can create. If you have more custom needs, um, say you want to have built-in monitoring for your tasks, um, health monitoring, any custom requirements, you don't just want to run your task on the command line, you want it to have a little more sophisticated functionality. Say you want to download a jar file and execute some uh, more complex logic, then you'll need a custom executor. So um, in your executor info, you will create your executor info um, in your framework only if you have a custom executor. If so, you're required to have the command info. And what the command info will have is typically a URI where you can go ahead and um, download your jar file or whatever it is that contains your executor. And the command will be a command to just launch that executor. And um, also, you have some optional fields, data fields, uh, resources. You need to declare some resources and so forth. Then in your task info, um, you have some required fields, resources, task ID, slave ID, all of that, but um, you have a choice. You can either specify the executor info or the command info. If you have a custom executor, you need to specify the executor info. If you're using the default Mesos command executor, then you need to specify the command info, and that command will be the command um, that is launched, and that will be your task. And it will be running in the default executor. So this is a little more detail. Um, we do have an option of running in Docker, and that will work fine with both the default command executor and also with your own custom executor. And you can specify that in your command info. Um, you can launch your, your task or your executor that way. Now some important Scenarios are handling failures. This is something we often have to do as framework developers. So we need to keep the scheduler up. Um, as I mentioned, re-register with the framework ID, reconcile the tasks, and continue. We have framework registration. So the different events that were mentioned, register, re-register, disconnect in, error. And we need to handle all these states. Um, in our scheduler and make sure we account for all these possible scenarios. So uh, we also have a number of task status updates and this is handled in the scheduler once we, we receive these status updates. So these are task killed, um, which is either explicit or implicit. It could happen when the failover timeout elapses and then your tasks are killed or if your framework is killed or it can explicitly happen if a, a task is actually uh, killed in response to a scheduler request. We have task error. You know, this is a common one when something is malformed. There's a slave ID. It's incorrect. Um, perhaps the, error, the offer is no longer valid. Then we have task failed. Um, this is when it's, the task is a valid, it's a valid format, but a common one is the URI fails to download 
or something happens out of memory. Then we have task lost. Um, again, the validation is OK, but something happened. Either the slave disconnected and it got lost, or there was a communication error. And uh, an interesting th thing to note is task failed versus task lost. If your task is lost, most likely you can try again. Um, the task may, may, may succeed the next time, but task failed, it will probably fail again, and you'll probably have to check the sandbox and figure out exactly why. So here are the different reasons for the task status update. And this is pretty useful if you want to dive in and debug, because you can figure out why, why exactly the task was updated in the way it is, such as executor terminated. OK, and now I'd like to um, invite Nicholas over. He's going to go over some more advanced framework development features. Hello, everyone. Um, this was a ton of information. Huh? Um, so I'll try to go over some of the more advanced topics quickly so we can get to work on, uh, on Rindler, which is the demo framework that you guys now have on your computers. Um, Elizabeth briefly touched upon the difference between status updates and framework messages in terms of delivering guarantees. So Mesos is built on a actor system or message passing system called libprocess. And by default and in its nature, it is a one-way message passing. And the only thing it guarantees is an at most once um, delivery. And that is what framework messages is basically doing. So a framework message would go from the framework to the, to the master and from the master to the slave and so on in a um, best effort way. If it's been dropped on the way, there's no act cycles that will make sure that it eventually gets there. But status updates, on the other hand, have much stronger guarantees. They're persistent to disk on the slaves. The slave will have a, a queue of status updates. And only when the framework is acknowledging that a status update has been received, will it continue to the next status update. So while status updates are much stronger, um, there's a much stronger guarantees around status updates, you need to do something called task reconciliation in certain circumstances. Doing master failover or framework failover, you may get into a situation where you need to reconcile the state and the knowledge about your tasks and what the, mes what the Mesos master knows about the tasks. So Mesos can do reconciliation in two modes, in the explicit mode and an implicit mode. In the explicit mode, you give a list of status updates and say, this is what I assume is the truth, and the master will send the difference in status updates back to you. In the implicit way, you send an empty list, and the master will send status updates for everything that's running and everything that it knows about. So this right here is an algorithm on how to implement task reconciliation for Mesos. A lot of the state in Mesos is stored in its leaf nodes. So when there's a master failover, the slaves will reconnect to the new master and tell about what they know about what's running. That means that in the interim, the master might have zero slaves attached, but you should make no assumptions that the task is actually gone yet. So this algorithm is up here and that you can find in the Mesos reconciliation documentation. It's a way to keep trying to, to get the, the current information, the accurate information about a, um, um, your current running tasks, um, which is implemented with a um, truncated exponential bag off. Um, for whoever is interested in implementing this for our test framework, you can pull any of us, and then we can start working on it together. Another thing you might work on is framework authentication. It's very easy. It's a part of the framework registration where you can give a principle and a secret that the master, by default, can verify against a um, username and password list. Um, but that could also be done in a pluggable way. But in any regard, this is something where if you guys get, get set up with Rindler, which is our test framework, that we can implement, hopefully within the hour that we have today. 
after authorize, or being authorized, you can use that piece of information to limit the capabilities of different frameworks in the cluster. So here, um, there are different ACLs that limits different um, users, like principles and secrets, to register as certain roles. So roles is kind of pretty much kind of a group of frameworks in a Mesos cluster. And you can petition resources based on, on those roles. Um, so therefore, it may make good sense to have your prod environment being separated from a, um, a test environment in this way. Um, another thing you can enforce with ACLs is what users the different tasks can run as. <clears throat> a, a part of the more recent changes to the framework API is dynamic reservations. So right now, you have launch tasks, which is your way of accepting an offer. A part of the offer cycle is like you get the offer, you, you can introspect it, you can either decline it or you can launch on them. But now you have a generic call that's called accept. And what it lets you do is to give you a list of operations that you want to carry out. So instead of only launch tasks, we now have other capabilities um, that you want to do in the same go. Right? So we can't do them. We cannot do them independently. So this is almost like a, a transaction. Um, so for dynam dynamic reservations, you now have a reserve operation that you can call in order to reserve re um, resources on that particular box. And um, symmetrically, you can also unreserve. This ties into um, the persistent volumes API that you use the same way, um, where one operation is to create a persistent volume. A persistent volume is really data that exceeds the lifetime of that particular task, and even exceeds the lifetime of that particular slave. Um, and you'll actually have to use it if you want to write anything that is stateful on a Mesos cluster. Here's like a few key, uh, um, key pointers and tips before we get into the actual framework development. First off, in the callbacks, um, try never to, to block or to have any sleeps or anything like that. Um, for example, in the status update, if you don't have um, explicit status updates, then the framework will not send a acknowledgement to the slave about receiving the status update before the callback has returned. That means that you can actually hawk an entire cluster if you don't return immediately. The scheduler driver pointer, which you get for each and every callback, will not change over time. <clears throat> and then task IDs must be unique within the same framework. Even like from tasks that have finished already, um, you'll get unexpected behavior if you start reusing the task IDs. As mentioned with um, persistence primitives, things that you store in the sandbox um, may go away. So there's something called a garbage collector in the slave that computes the available space on the um, sandbox mount. And if you're running out of space, it will start cleaning up those executive directories. Secondly, um, we want to you should be encouraging not to make any assumptions about the environment. and That's why scheduling containers is such a great thing. Um, or else you probably need to bundle most of the things that you want to use as um, artifacts for the, for the task. And um, not all uh, private data centers have access to the internet. So uh, distributing ta task artifacts via, via HTTPS or distributed uh, policy systems is something you should also do. For legacy applications, you need to make sure that more than one um, task and executor can run on the same box. So if you make any assumptions about the TCP port that a task is, is, is binding to, you may run into, run into problems. Then you should also like, verify that you are connecting to a, a Mesos master that has the capability that you expect. So part of the master info that you could get back will have the version number of the master that you're connecting to. So if you're using persistence primitives or dynamic reservations, then you won't get run, run into errors um, so you can fail fast. Uh, 
So right now, um, all language bindings are using libmesos. Libmesos is a huge .so that has most of the mesos runtime inside of it. Um, and unfortunately, this is shown to be um, a big limitation. Um, for example, distribution of the language bindings. Distributing um, things that are like non-language -na native, for example, with PyPy, is, is a big problem. It's actually pretty error prone. Um, when you're using um, Java or Scala, you have a highly concurrent VM with JVM. Then you ha have a highly concurrent runtime from Mesos. And we've been running into a ton of problems making those um, work well together. So we think we could do, could do better. So right now, we are moving towards a purely HTTP API for the scheduler writers. There'll be one endpoint that will be available. And you register with the HTTP post, and then you will get a persistent connection that will give you uh, chunk en encoded uh, messages back as an event stream. Then subsequently, you do HTTP posts to, to the master in order to do any kind of operations to say accept offers, decline offers, kill tasks, and so forth. Um, there'll be early support in O24. It's not done yet. Um, so, so far, you can use some of the pure bindings that have been written. Um, they will have to change too. Um, but there is, let's see if we go back here. Um, some examples out there, like Mesos Go is purely written in Go now. Pesos is the Python um, native um, bindings. And Jesos is the Java um, native um, bindings. So that's the end of this deck. Um, the thing that you have on your USB keys right now is an example framework that we've been using to teach people how to write schedulers. And it's something called Rindler. Let's see if the uh, internet got up with us. So Rindler is a web crawler and web renderer. So uh, please use a task limit when you're using the conference Wi-Fi, or else we will DDoS everything. Um, the thing that it does is that it crawls um, a, um, a website, and it generates tasks in order to continue crawling, but also to pull the website and render it into pixels. And when we are done, let's see if you can make. It will actually generate a huge graph between the websites that you came from and the websites you're going to. Um, and this is a picture of our old website. Uh, that, we, that we are crawling. Um, but it's, 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 it's pretty interesting. Like, there's two parts to it, and it has two different executors, and has two different run queues. Um, so what we would encourage you to do is to first off get in running. This has been, has been implemented in a bunch of languages, in C++, in Go, Haskell, if you're really brave, um, Java, and Python, and Scala. Um, so pretty much in any of these languages, um, pick one. Um, make it run, and then um, as a first exercise, try to implement framework authentication. So, so far, um, if there's any questions, um, we could talk over that particular point if th it didn't make sense doing like this uh, brief introduction to, uh, to the Schedule API. One quick word of warning, since this is a web crawling framework and this is conference Wi-Fi, uh, please you know, don't let it crawl for 10 minutes at a time. You could potentially slow down everybody else. So get it up and going just you know, long enough to know that it works, and then we'll get into actually coding, which is the fun part anyway, right? Yeah, and um, another note here, um, framework authentication is a great small thing to do within this hour, but if there's other custom functionality you would like to add or you would like to try out something else, like task reconciliation, go right ahead. Um, we're open, this is about implementing production level features on the Rendler. 
And we would like also for you guys to get to know other people other than just your own company. So feel free to move around. Um, I don't know if we want to pick a specific area based on language or musical chairs. Musical chairs. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Python. Python okay, over there's there. Python. Anyone else want to volunteer to who's interested in the language? All right. So if you like Python, you can go over there. <laughs> Just raise your hands if you have questions. There are several of us that will mill around and try and help you out. Mesos USB, Mesosphere, and I can see uh, Kubernetes Marathon Nibbler as well. So I want to show you guys one thing. In the instance of you starting um, a framework without an OBL limit and letting it run for too long, there is a kill switch um, that I'm going to show you. The thing you need to do is to go to the frameworks um, and figure out what, what ID that you guys have. So you, you had a, had a scheduler running for too long. It registered with a long timeout, so it won't go away by itself. So you actually want to shut it down. Create a file called framework, with framework ID equals this. And then with your favorite HTTP um, client, you post to, let's get us some help from this master. So actually for all the process processes, which Mesos is based on, so for all Mesos processes, there's a help endpoint that describes all the available endpoints that you can get. Um, that's super useful when you write, want to write tooling around Mesos, when you want to get insight into the, the state. Um, we wrote Mesos DNS, which introspect, introspects state.json. But in any regard, there's a lot of information in here. Um, so it will say here there's something called master shutdown. And too long didn't read. Um, it will kill everything that belongs to that. Um, so we go to this guy. And that's, that's all you have to do. Um, I won't do it now, because then I, I, would, I would kill Marathon. Um, but if you run into situations where um, you have task running, the framework registered with a very long timeout, and you actually do want to kill it, so you can see that um, the default behavior and what you see in a lot of clusters is that frameworks always need to stay alive. Um, but in the case of like, what we're doing here, we have like short running 
um, we have a short lifetime of, of, the, of the framework, so you may have to kill it. Um, so this is what you do.